Welcome to the New Church Podcast. So good morning. Welcome to part three of How to Vote Like a Christian. I'm the non-controversial one. So uh, I'm going to start off this morning by reading you a passage that is not in the, uh, it's not actually on the, won't be on the screen, so you'll have to, I know it's old school, you'll, you'll just have to listen to me read it. This is from Hebrews chapter 12. Um, I'm beginning with verse 22. Because I want us to answer the question, what's happening here this morning? What's going on? So I'm going to read you this passage to help, help you remember. But y'all have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than Abel. And once before you heard Frank preach on this as he went through it, because the fact of the matter is, is that that is where you are right now. Sometimes people go, well, Kemper, I don't, I don't see a bunch of angels and dead guys and stuff like that here. I don't see Jesus enthroned and everything. So that's likely just metaphorical. But I'd point out to you that the passages just before that, with which the author of Hebrews is contrasting those, has to do with the ranks of the Am Yahweh, of the people of Israel, as they stood before Sinai, and Moses was receiving the law from God, and all that stuff wasn't metaphorical. They stood before the mountain, the mountain shook, there was fire and thunder, and a massive voice that was so loud that they had to cover their ears and so forth. That was all quite literal. And the author of the Hebrews is not contrasting something metaphorical with something literal. He is telling you something that is true. That is true. That we are basically fused with heaven. Or perhaps heaven is fused with us, however you want to look at that. And even though those realities to us are not seen realities, they are realities. And we stand in the presence of God this morning. No matter how bad the sermon is, no matter how bad the singing is, no matter how flaky the people are, no matter how bored you are or anything, one thing you should know is that when people come together, heaven and earth fuse, they come together in the name of Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew 18, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And that's not metaphorical either. Right? The Bible says things like, Uh, in Ephesians 1, that when we were regenerated in Christ, that we were seated at the right hand of the Father in Christ Himself. That's not metaphorical. That's your position before God. That's not like, you know, a pretty figure. That's the truth. When Paul writes in Colossians that your life is hid with Christ in God, that's exactly what he means. Now, I'm pointing all that up because that's all about the interpenetration of heaven and earth. And folks, that's what reality is. Reality is the spiritual realm and the physical realm interpenetrate. Perichoretic, it's called theologically. And that is a true thing. Whether you see it or not, whether it's an unseen reality, it is still a reality. And that's an important point to realize when we're worshiping or when we're doing anything else in life. Because that's truth. Not the pagan mythologies you've been taught about how there's some massive separation between the spiritual and the physical. It's just not true. And it's a good thing because you yourself are both physical and spiritual. And if it wasn't true, you'd be a very different creature indeed. Okay, that's my introduction to the non-controversial part. 
So, Father, I ask that you would be with us this morning, that you would attend the study and the preaching of your word, and that you'd be present by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This is normally called the uh, Great Commission. right? And once again, we normally understand this as uh, being a particular way. We're going to look at that again in a second. Now Galatians 4, 6. And because y'all are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. These passages point out a very foundational truth about God, that God is triune. He is a trinity, one God in three persons, three persons in one God. God is not more one than he is three, and he's not more three than he is one. He is simultaneously and equally one and three, and it's always been so, always. That truth is laid out in summary, in uh, the summary of the biblical truth, in the creeds of the church, right? Uh, we sing one most Sundays here. Uh, and I'm going to read to you now from Quicunque Volt, which is the Athanasian Creed. And it says, We worship one God in Trinity, in Trinity and Unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there's one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Spirit. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. And in this Trinity, none is a four nor after another, none is greater nor less than another, but the whole three persons are co-eternal and co-equal, so that in all things, as aforesaid, the unity in Trinity and the Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. So, you may be wondering, why am I beginning a sermon on voting with a look at the Trinity? What relevance could that possibly have to voting? The answer to that is, well, everything, as it does to everything else. How so, you may be asking. We are, all of us, humans, you and I, made in the image of God, the God who is triune, who is one God in three persons, and that is the God whose image we bear, the image that defines us as human persons. That's why we are humans, because we bear the image of God. Now, the fact that God is simultaneously one and three he is simultaneously a unity and a diversity, that he is singular and at the same time a community of persons affects our existence as his images. It's ridiculous for you to think about being the image of God if you don't think who God is. And generally there's a disconnect in people's heads. Right? For instance, we're told in Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So both men and women are the image of God. Individually, as you are, individually, and together. Both sexes are necessary together to present a fuller image of God. And this shouldn't surprise us, since God is both singular, one God, and a community, three persons. And God's image in humanity is shown in both individual humans and in male and female, a community of persons who, when married, produce children in most cases, which further expands the fullness of the triune image in humanity. However, the family is not the only community of God's images of humans. There are as well the existence of the church. Most of you are part of the church, both the church uh, Catholic or universal, and most of you, this church here, uh, most of you as well are have friends, you have relationships, and you're friends. Most of you do. Some of you probably shouldn't, but most of you do, right? 
Most of us have business relations where the employees of someone are the employer of someone. Right? We're, we've got someone we work for. And then there's also the state, or as it's sometimes called, the civil government. The reformers, Luther, Calvin, and so forth, and their heirs called these separate arenas of human communal life, they called those spheres, right? <clears throat> and they believed, <clears throat> excuse me, correctly, that each of these covenantal spheres were directly addressed in the Bible as God's will for each of these areas. His rules and boundaries were revealed there with each sphere, church, family, and so forth, having its separate function and responsibility before God, which were not the function and responsibility of the other spheres. Well, what the heck do I mean by that? I'll give you for instance. The church is not to raise armies and war in that fashion. The state is not to raise our children. Businesses are not to govern the people. They each have particular functions and responsibilities as separate spheres. Each sphere has its proper God-ordained function the principles of which are laid out in the Bible. As, for instance, Ephesians 5 and 6 speak to the family, Romans 13 speaks to the state, and so forth and so on. Right? Now, though these spheres are separate, humans can and do simultaneously exist in multiple spheres. Most of us are members of families, yet also have jobs, the business sphere, and have friends, the sphere of friendship, <clears throat> and are members of a church, the ecclesiastical or church sphere, and we understand our responsibilities, at least generally, in each area. <clears throat> in each of these areas, excuse me, tasting. <clears throat> in each of these areas, we have responsibilities and functions that are established by God and are consequently the pathways of our freedom and fulfillment as we do those things in each sphere. And we are intended by God to execute, to perform those responsibilities and functions. To the extent that we do not perform those responsibilities and functions, to that extent we experience dysfunction, bondage, and misery. Obedience to God is freedom because that is what we were intended by God to do. Obedience to God is freedom. Let's say that together. Obedience to God is freedom. Just so you remember. Here in the United States, we have something of an unusual situation. It's less usual than it used to be when America first got cranking. Uh, other nations have basically copied it. Um, we have an unusual situation because our civil government is as our founding documents declare, actually governed representatively by the people. And our government's powers derive from the people themselves. In America, if you are a citizen, you are also part of the civil governmental sphere, not just as someone who obeys laws, but as someone who rules, in addition to the other spheres of your life. This means, of course, that in America, every citizen has responsibilities and functions relating to civil government. In a constitutional republic, such as ours in the United States, within the boundaries of the Constitution, you rule. I don't want some like you rule, dude, but you rule. You and I choose the politicians, legislators, judges, and so forth in our system. This means that a very real case can be made that you and I are Caesar in our system. And Caesar, like all civil magistrates, has responsibility before God. You and I are Caesar. Romans 13, 1 through 5. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist 
will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. So, rulers are God's ministers for good to restrain evil and the rulers who are God's ministers are to execute wrath, avenging those who practice evil for the sake of good. That's pretty straight ahead, I think. Doesn't require a lot of interpretation, although Lord knows massive portions of the church are attempting with all their might and main to interpret that pretty plain thing as to mean something completely different than what it says. Who are the ultimate rulers, the final authority in the sphere of civil government in the United States? The people, you and I. And it's thus our responsibility to defend the good and restrain evil in our representative government. So how do we do that? We vote for those who best represent the promotion and defense of the good and resistance to evil. That's pretty easy. It's not as easy as it sounds because of all the disinformation and propaganda that is promulgated by the media and other things, misunderstandings and so forth, which means you actually have to exert yourself to figure out who's lying through their teeth and who's not. But that's part of restraining evil, you see. Because you don't want the evil guys to say they're good and then get in power. Because your responsibility, minister of God, Caesar, is to promote the good and restrain the evil. If you are a citizen of the United States of voting age, it is your responsibility to exercise your vote to promote good and restrain evil because in addition to whatever other spheres you may be part of, family, church, business, and so forth, as a citizen, you are also not only in the sphere of civil government, but you are a ruler in that sphere and are responsible to exercise your power to promote good and restrain evil in the best way possible. I've got a little hint for you here. We live in a fallen world and it is messy, friends. It is messy. We're supposed to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves and that means we have to actually be wise. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to be harmless as doves. We have to be wise, right? And that means <clears throat> that we have to consider what the situation is on the ground and take the best possible course that we can in the situation in which we live to promote good and restrain evil. Now, currently there are a number of people who don't like either presidential candidate in this election generally because they don't like the personality of the one and the policies of the other, who have said they're just simply not going to vote. The problem with this is that we citizens are responsible before God, not only in our private or family life to obey God, but also in the more public sphere of civil government. For us to abrogate or abandon our responsibility as the true rulers in our system to defend the good and to restrain evil is to invite, wait for it, the judgment of God. Now, yes, as we've seen repeatedly in this season, uh, series on voting, God still judges nations. And America is currently under judgment to some extent. You can easily gauge where on the Ark of Covenantal judgment we are by consulting Deuteronomy 28. We've heard that God judges nations according to their leaders and laws, as Frank's told us repeatedly, which is true. But in our system, where do you think those leaders and laws come from? Yes, fellow Caesar, that's right, from you and me. So in America, the leaders and laws that bring down God's judgment include ooh, us. Suck fest. Right? 
I don't think that's a leap in logic. Our responsibility before God is to exercise our vote to promote good and restrain evil. And where do we find the definition of good to be promoted and evil to be restrained? Hmm. In God's word, of course. God is the one who, having created us to image him out in all these multiple spheres of life, also has established his commands, his rules for each of those spheres, which rules are not only the only ways of freedom and joy and wholeness, but they're also the ways that keep God's judgment at bay in a fallen world. As Frank has pointed out to us, there are a number of things in our nation that are lightning rods to God's judgment. Easily the most egregious, the most evil of these is abortion on demand, the legally supported murder of unborn humans in the womb. At this point in time, 2020, hashtag Jesus 2020, this time in uh, time, 2020, we've murdered around 60 million people for the sake of convenience and personal economic ease. That's like wiping out the population of Texas twice or Texas and California together, Poof, dead. All right. Mass murder and the judicially innocent blood of those so murdered cries out to God from our blood polluted soil. Don't you think it does? This is an evil that must be restrained and overthrown in our country or eventually there won't be a country. Then there's the other assault on the family in America, the legitimization of gender confusion with its sexual perversions in multiple directions. Add to this things like the political promotion of the evil of socialism, based as it is on governmental theft and the violation of biblical concepts of personal property and principles of private wealth, so forth, these evil things and a number of others must be stopped if we are to promote righteousness, the good, and restrain unrighteousness, evil, that requires us to exercise our powers as rulers by, at the very least, voting responsibly for representatives who will represent our desire before God to promote righteousness and restrain evil. Yes, brothers and sisters, personal peace and a sense of personal well-being is not enough. The corporate sphere, the public sphere is also to be godly. You are your brother's keeper. And there are rules and resultant blessings of judgment or peace, harmony for both aspects of life. I'm going to do something today I normally never like to do. I'm going to take issue with a theologian I have a great <clears throat> amount of respect for and have been helped by in the past, John Piper, who very recently published an article called Policies, Persons, and Paths to Ruin, in which he urges that we should realize that, and I'm quoting, flagrant boastfulness, vulgarity, and factiousness are not only self-incriminating, they are nation-corrupting with the strong implication that we should not vote for such a person. Now, he doesn't name them, but I guess turnaround is fair play. And astoundingly, he maintains that such a person cannot be, and I quote again, effectively pro-life, and that the character issue is as important as the abortion issue, since, you know, it might lead the citizens to be like that guy. And therefore, the murder and genocide of millions of people is tolerable if we can all just not be boastful, vulgar, and factious in our private sphere. We'd be very holy and pious in our homes while they murder children up the street. Now, I certainly think believers should not be boastful, vulgar, and factious, but I think that murder on a mass scale might just be more evil, and I think Scripture bears me out on that. As to some of the qualities that Piper might think reprehensible in a ruler, I'd like to point out, as to rudeness, what Jesus says in Matthew 23, 27 through 33. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, broods of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? This is Jesus speaking very non-politely to the Pharisees. Hmm, maybe Jesus should read Piper's article. As to factiousness or causing division, we might look at Matthew 10, 34 through 39, as Jesus says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. There are, according to Jesus here, Things worth being divided and factious about. Righteousness does cause division. And Jesus didn't mind saying so. I think Jesus is more qualified to be our leader than anyone else. He is, after all, our king. And he seems to have a much more advanced idea about notions of rudeness and factiousness than John Piper does. The issue in all this, I think, can be seen in what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23, verses 23 and 24. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, we're back to that, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone, blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. The weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith, seem to be weightier, more important, and I would think mass genocidal murder, sex trafficking, unrestricted freedom of religion, gender confusions, economic wickedness such as socialism, and so forth, qualify as weightier matters. It would appear that John Piper has some confusion going on about public and private spheres of spirituality, I'm very sorry to say. And he's not the only person to advance such a pietistic retreatist theological confusion, which is why I am honestly, reluctantly addressing it. I'd also like to point out when it comes to personal flaws in leaders, there's only one person other than the Lord Jesus Christ who is called Hamashiach, which means the Messiah or the uh, anointed one in scripture, and that is the Persian emperor Cyrus the Great, named so by God in Isaiah 45.1, the ruler who allowed the Jews under Ezra and Nehemiah to return to Jerusalem and build, rebuild the temple. But here's the thing. Cyrus was a pagan and consequently likely had a number of character flaws, you know, like idolatry. Nonetheless, Cyrus was God's chosen to restore the state of God's people. Though character does matter, there are weightier issues to be dealt with. We are, as believers, you and I, at war with the forces of evil. As Ephesians 6.12 tells us, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our ultimate battle is against the satanic forces of the fallen world system. But this should not lead you to think that that ongoing conflict is limited to the spiritual arena. Our enemies here, principalities, powers, and so forth, have influence and control, in part, over human lives and structures and areas. The war is over control of human lives and society in real-world settings. Though spiritual, this is real-world war in every arena of human life 
war that takes place in every sphere of human existence. And you remember that I opened this talk by talking about how worship is the spiritual and the physical intertwined and that you exist as a physical, spiritual thing and that we are seated at the right hand of the Father and those are central, foundational truths and all of reality is like that. There is no part of reality that is separate from the principles of God. As we've seen, one of those spheres is civil government. Folks, the, uh, the church has been called a hospital, and that's true. But if the church is a hospital, it is a military hospital. Because the church is to be an army, the army of the Lord, which exists in part to expand the rule of Christ's kingdom in every sphere, in every arena of life. We are all to, as Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 3, endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ and to fight the good fight of faith, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 12. We are to fight for righteousness in preaching the gospel, in praying, in the patterns of our lives, in resisting Satan and his minions, in exercising our abilities and authority in every arena of our lives to war for the expanse of the rule of Christ and his kingdom. And this includes the sphere of civil governance in which we as believers and Caesars must exercise our responsibility as voters to resist our society's evils and to promote godliness in our policies and in our laws. We must learn to think biblically, not only about the civil government, but about every sphere and area of our lives. And folks, I am very happy to say that I know a goodly number of y'all are reading through the Bible. This is our current practice here in this church and are learning lots of things about it. And that's great because step one, know what the Bible says. But then you come up to the somewhat more perplexing idea of how do I apply what all this stuff says to life in the real world? It's called theology, right? But if you don't know the Bible much, it's difficult to get the theology of it. So we're in step one here, brothers and sisters. We're reading the Bible as a people together, many of you for the first time, right? And I'm telling you, every sphere of human existence that exists is spoken to you by the Word of God. To not know the Word, to not know how it applies, is to commit spiritual suicide. And rather than being the army of Jesus Christ, defeated, and miserable and not know what to do, escapist. And most importantly, to disappoint the Lord Jesus, not only in our personal lives, but in our generation. So I would say to all of y'all, be the church. If these online resources have been meaningful to you, please consider going to newchurch.love slash give and show your support by helping make this ministry possible. Thank you.